legend, a San Francisco icon, Willie Stretch McCovey embodied what it means to be a giant. In the summer of 59, San Francisco fell in love with the smooth swing and the quiet confidence of a first baseman from Alabama. He went four for four at Seal Stadium in his major league debut. 51 games later, McCovey was named the National League Rookie of the Year. He soon became a threat at the plate and in the field, appearing in six All-Star games and breaking the National League record for Grand Slams with 18. Now the 2-2 pitch to McCovey. Drive the deep left field. Back goes Crawford, still going back. It's gone! A Grand Slam home run! In 1969, McCovey was named National League MVP. Most knowledgeable baseball men consider Willie the most feared hitter in the game. After the 1980 season, McCovey finished his 22-year career, having spent 19 of them in a Giants uniform. In his first year on the ballot, McCovey was enshrined in Cooperstown. Willie Mack was the most feared left-handed hitter of his generation, but he will also be remembered as the ultimate teammate, a man who epitomized true leadership and competitive spirit. Tryon and hit in the alley, the alley and right center field. McCovey with a double, and the Giants have won it. The congratulations are all for McCovey. The Giants are mobbing Willie Mack. After his playing days were over, McCovey continued to serve as an advisor to the Giants and dedicated himself to helping the greater community. Today, Willie McCovey's impact on the organization and the city is undeniable. From the Cove bearing his name to the annual Willie Mack Award, his legacy lives on in Giants tradition. I'm happy to stand here at the end of a long and successful career. And if there is a second life, I'd like to come back as a Major League Baseball player. He will be forever giant. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate the life of a true gentle giant and someone who was so dear to all of us, our beloved Willie McCovey. I was asked to share some personal reflections about Mr. McCovey. He always told me to call him Willie, but it just never felt right to me. Like so many of you, I grew up watching him play at Candlestick, and he was a childhood hero of mine. So I always had to address him with the utmost respect for what he meant to the game, to the Giants, and to the city of San Francisco. Mr. McCovey first met my mom about 10 years ago, and mother proceeded to tell him what he did in his major league debut. Four for four and two triples, she said. And Mr. McCovey turned to me and said, I see where you get it from. And from that day forward, he would always ask me, how's mom? That's how big his heart was. That's our beloved number 44. He rarely missed a game since this ballpark opened and he sat just a couple of doors down from the PA booth. So I had the privilege of seeing him at almost every game. And I never, ever saw him without that lovely, warm smile on his face. And he greeted everyone and I mean everyone with sincere warmth, kindness, and grace. He was so inspirational in so many ways. For me, I will always remember his brilliant career, but even more, I will always remember that he had a total joy and zest for life, and he lived with gratitude each and every day in spite of the many physical challenges that he faced. He truly lived with a grateful heart. To have developed a close friendship with Mr. McCovey 
and his beloved bride, Mrs. Stella, over the last several years has been one of the true great joys and honors of my life. And I was overcome with emotion when they asked me to be a part of their lovely wedding on August 1st. It was one of the most beautiful weddings I've ever seen. They were like two little high school sweethearts. It was unbelievable. So I am so honored to be with all of you today to celebrate a life well lived and a game well played. And so, on behalf of Giants fans everywhere, I want Willie's wife, Estella, his daughter, Allison, his grandchildren, Raven, PJ, and Melissa, his siblings, Francis, Clausel, and Cleon, and Willie's entire extended family, please know that we are all right here for you, right by your side, to offer our love and our prayers for you all at this difficult time. We love you all so very much. And now I would like to bring up Giants President and CEO, Larry Bear. Thank you, Rennell. Welcome and thank you all for being here today to pay tribute to the life of the great Willie McCovey. I want to extend our deepest condolences to Estella, Willie's daughter, Willie's wife Estella, Willie's daughter, Allison, three children, Allison's three children, Willie's three grandchildren who are here, Raven, Philip, and Melissa, and Willie's brother who is here from Mobile, Alabama, Clausel, as well as Willie's uh, sister and brother that couldn't make it, Francis and Cleon. Speaking on behalf of Giants organization, Giants ownership group, people very close to Willie in that group, the Dean and Burns family, the Johnson family, Peter McGowan, and also on behalf of two other Giants owners for whom Willie played, Horace Stoneham and his family, and Bob Lurie who is here today and his family. It's been more than a week since Willie passed, and the remembrances still resonate and keep, pour, keep pouring in. I don't expect them to stop anytime soon. Why? Because Willie represented the rhythms of our community growing up in the 60s and 70s in San Francisco, as I did. Batter number 44, Willie McCovey, Jeff Carter would announce on the Candlestick PA. That's right, Lon. Stretch McCovey would respond on the Giants pregame show to a long question from his friend Lon Simmons. I'd swing the big lumber left-handed McCovey style on 29th Avenue as we improvised a game of strikeout, as many kids did throughout Northern California. What baseball-loving kid could possibly resist number 44? That graceful, sweep, sweeping, almost languid swing that suddenly exploded into the ball. Those long legs galloping around the bases, his soft hands scooping a throw out of the dirt. I was already a huge fan of Willie's when at age seven, my mom and dad took me to Home Savings and Loan on 19th and Gary Boulevard to see Willie at a promotional event. I got to sit on this great man's lap and I remember I could barely breathe, I was so in awe. Now, years later, decades later, when I mentioned that to Willie, he'd say, yeah, that's why I had all those knee surgeries. <laughs> I'm an even bigger fan today because I've had the extraordinarily good fortune for the past 30 years to be Willie's friend. So many of my partners at the Giants, like Bob Sokoloff, and colleagues at the Giants, like Mario Alioto, have befriended Willie as well for decades in very powerful friendships. Willie gave me the honor of officiating his wedding to Estella in August. They chose the Giants Clubhouse as the venue. I thought that was perfect because the Giants have been Willie's family and the ballpark is home since that day he left Mobile, Alabama in 1955 at age 17. 
Willie arrived actually in San Francisco in early 1959, as mentioned, four for four in his first game at Seal Stadium. But Willie arrived in 1959 and so different than happens in our crazy world of professional sports now. Willie got here in 1959, he never left. The same Woodside home he lived in during his playing days, he remained in to his dying day. No Giants player, no player has ever been more beloved in our community than Willie McCovey. He immediately made himself a part of the city. He loved people and had a quiet humility that put everyone at ease. He'd go out into the neighborhoods, hang out with Jeanette Etheridge at Tosca, play golf at Lake Merced, greet the regulars around North Beach by name. He was so warm and gracious, so authentic, that soon after meeting him, you'd swear he was a regular guy, and he was. We all know what he did on the field in his 19 years in a Giants uniform. I won't go into that now, but I'm gonna talk about one at bat. Every sports hero has an indelible moment that, he li that lives on long after he or she does. Willie's indelible moment happened to be a screaming line drive that found Bobby Richardson's glove in game seven of the 1962 World Series. A few feet one way or another, people say, and Willie's legacy rises to a whole different level. Well, I couldn't disagree with that more. Even if that line drive had gotten past Bobby Richardson and driven in the winning run, that one heroic moment would never have defined Willie's legacy. His legacy transcends baseball, transcends his six all-star appearances, his Rookie of the Year award, his MVP, even his Hall of Fame induction. So while future generations of visitors to the Hall of Fame will remember Willie the player, future generations of Giants fans and San Franciscans will admire Willie the man himself. Because Willie had a way about him that was unforgettable. The admiration that we will have for him, for all of us that touched him, will carry permanence. They will watch a Giants player in future decades, honored before a game one day with the Willie Mack Award. We have many Willie Mack Award winners here today and in the, um, on the field. And that Willie Mack Award will carry forever the deep meaning as a tribute to a man whose dignity, kindness, and heart made him one of the most beloved and inspirational athletes in the history of Northern California. They'll see people in future decades continuing to donate baseball gloves to the Giants Junior, Junior Giants Stretch Drive and learn that it too is named after that same man, Stretch McCovey, who was devoted to helping his community, especially kids who, like him, might find friends, fun, and even purpose in baseball. We have many Junior Giants here today. We have the Giants Community Fund Board here today. Thank you, Willie, for all you've done for the Junior Giants for decades. Future generations will also watch a home run splash into Willie McCovey Cove, or McCovey Cove, and learn, yes, it too bears the name of a man who watched home runs from his suite next to the broadcast booth and who loved his team so much, he showed up for every home game, even when he was in great pain from his knee surgeries, even when he was confined to a wheelchair, even when he was there on a gurney. They'll also see his retired number 44 hanging in left field and a statute on the water's edge and know he was one of the greatest baseball players who ever pulled on a uniform for any team. Permanence. Permanence. Willie's persona is chiseled in our collective souls. You want to think, and I was thinking this last week, that 
You know, just you think that Willie will live forever. You don't think of Willie not being around. I found myself thinking that a lot last week. But since then, I've realized two things. One, there was no person like him. And two, here in San Francisco, he will live forever. I love you, Willie. Thank you so much, Larry. And now, everyone, would you please welcome the mayor of the city and county of San Francisco, the Honorable London Breed. Thank you, Rennell. And thank you, everyone, for being here today, from all the fans in the stands, to Willie McCovey's family and former teammates here on the field, and you, the tireless Willie Mays, who has joined us here today. Thank you all for coming together to recognize and remember and celebrate a true San Francisco giant. I am incredibly honored to speak for a few minutes today on behalf of the city of San Francisco, a city that loved Willie McCovey as much as it could love one of its adopted sons. And as Willie Mays said just last week, you could talk all day about the balls that McCovey hit. But I'll leave that to all these great baseball players who have joined us here today. We all know about McCovey's incredible baseball legacy. But as mayor of this grateful city, I want to speak briefly about the man himself. Stretch McCovey was more than just a great baseball player. He was a San Franciscan through and through. He was a deeply loving and caring person, a man of incredible warmth, humility, and kindness and that made him one of our most beloved citizens. There's a reason the Willie Mack Award was created. It was the epitome of a great teammate on and off the field. He was a role model for other athletes and for our kids throughout his career as a player and will continue to be with this amazing legacy that he has left. From his first electrifying day as a San Francisco Giant in 1959, he was a champion for and a reflection of the hopes and dreams of thousands of African Americans that migrated to the Bay Area, including my grandparents, in the decades after World War II. When he retired, he may have stopped playing the game, but he never stepped away from the Giants or from the community. As a player and long after, Willie Mack was a man about town with a gentle smile and a warm and kind word for everyone he met. When I was in high school, as a young soft player for the Galileo Lions, I wanted to hit the ball as hard as McCovey. Well, clearly I wasn't able to do that. I don't think anyone could. But later in life, I learned that I can emulate his positive outlook and his generous spirit. In his honor, we have McCovey Cove just beyond the outfield wall and a statue of Willie Mack just across the water at McCovey Point. And that's how it should be. We mourn his loss but we should celebrate everything that he accomplished and everything that he represents. That powerful swing, that powerful smile, that wonderful man. On behalf of the city, I want to offer my condolences to Willie's family, his wife Estella, his daughter Allison, and her children, Raven, Philip, and Marissa. And I'm proud to join all of you here today and the Giants community to celebrate an amazing ball player 
and above all, an amazing man. Thank you. Baseball and family together have shaped my character, my value, and my career. When I talk about my family, I'm really talking about two families. All of them and the others with the McCovey family name in Mobile, Alabama, and throughout the country are part of me and share on this occasion today. I have another family. And it is a family of good, genuine, caring people who opened their hearts and their homes to me over the years. I guess you might say they adopted me and made me part of their families. Come to think of it, I'm not sure how I ever got to be known as a loner when I was actually surrounded by so many special, loving people. I've been adopted, too, by all the thousands of great Giants fans everywhere. And by the city of San Francisco, where I've always been welcomed like the Golden Gate Bridge and the cable cars, I've been made to feel like a landmark too. And now everyone, please welcome another inspirational forever giant in his own right, and the recipient of the 1989 Willie Mack Award, Dave Dravecki. Thank you so much for giving me the incredible honor of um, sharing a few words about a man that I came to know um, and a man that I considered a friend. You know, um, Willie mentioned something in that video that I think is so indicative of this organization because it's more than an organization, it's a family. We rejoice with one another. We cry with one another, we laugh with one another, we celebrate with one another. And today, we're celebrating a life. Throughout my life, um, God has put some amazing people in the middle of my story to teach me valuable lessons about how to live. Estella, I wanna thank you I want to thank you for the lesson that you were to me in the way that you loved your husband. I will never forget the smile on his face as the two of you became husband and wife and came down that, ele um, that aisle. And one of the things that I will never forget is who you are as a woman, one who made great sacrifice because of a deep love for Willie McCovey. Your sacrifice was selfless in a world that is so selfish. And I admire you so much because of that. Estelle, you have given me a great gift in that love. When I think about Willie and I think about um, what he has given to me as a result of his life. I'm reminded of a really quick story I want to share with you. I'll never forget being in spring training and as an ambassador for the San Francisco Giants, I had the privilege of being able to um, tell my story with the minor league players. And I remembered sharing in that story when I was traded from the Padres to the Giants that I actually hated the Giants. And so the next wave of players came in and we got to share that story again. And now Willie was actually present in that room. And I remembered saying, you know, I knew that the Giants and the Padres had a great rivalry and we didn't like them very much. And in the middle of that statement, Willie stopped me and he said, Dave, tell them the truth. And I said, oh my gosh, I use the word hate. Okay, we hated the Giants. And I will never forget that. And the reason why 
is because Willie was a man of integrity. He was an honest man. He was real, down to his very core. And I loved that so much about Willie McCovey. Every time I had the opportunity to spend with him, you could see that inc incredible integrity just ooze through his presence. The other word that I think of when I think about what Willie has given to me is humility. I have never been around a more humble man. I have never been around someone who lifted up others around him more than himself. I've never been around a man who loved so deeply and cared so much about wearing the Giants uniform and yet one who would be more than comfortable taking the back seat. Because that's who Willie McCovey was. And so as I think about Estelle and her life and Willie and his life, I think about these wonderful gifts that have been given to me, and not just me, but to all of us, all of us, for a woman who came to understand that there's no greater love on this planet than one laying down their life for a friend. And Willie was that friend. And I am so grateful for that, Estelle. And for Willie, he showed us the way. He showed us the way in how to live life. It was more than just a man who put up great numbers on the field. It was about a man who showed us the giant's way through the way he lived his life on and off the field. And that legacy will continue because it is embedded in our hearts. And so Willie, I am so thankful for the gift that you have given me through your integrity and your humility, which I will never forget, and helping me to remember the Giants way, because you were the epitome of the Giants way. You know, when we, we go through loss and we deal with pain and suffering, my wife and I are always reminded of a wonderful, wonderful statement of words that was penned by St. Paul, who said this, therefore we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. My hope and my prayer is that when I get to heaven, there will be a baseball field like AT&T in heaven. And the greatest gift, the greatest gift that God could give me is having the opportunity to pitch to Willie McCovey. And the greatest joy in my life in heaven will be watching him hit that hanging slider into the universe as we celebrate with joy how magnificent it was. Willie McCovey, I love you for more than just who you were wearing the uniform, playing the game, but for the man that you showed us all to be in the way you lived your life. Dave, thank you so much for sharing. That was beautiful. And now we're going to hear from Mr. McCovey's godson. Please welcome Jeff Dudum. I'd like to thank you all on behalf of the family for being here today. I want to thank 
the hospital teams that have been there for Willie for all these years, those endless phone calls that we've all made, and you were answering the phone every time, helping us through each of those moments. You know who you are, and we thank you from the family more than you'll ever know. And the Stanford team, last week, you shined. You were there, and you made it the best situation we could ever have been in under those terms. We want to thank you. In 1959, before I was born, my grandfather, John Dudum, went uh, uh, Willie went down to see him on Mission Street to go get linens for his house. And in those days, that's what most of the players did. They went down there, and he got them all the things they needed for their home, and they would drive off. The only difference was Willie came back that next day before the game to sit with my grandfather. And for 14 days after that, before the night games, Willie kept coming back and sitting with my grandfather. The stories I heard from Willie and the family was, I think he would have kept coming back, so we just took him to the house and had dinner. Willie was sitting there at a table of a family that took him in and made him one of us. He loved those cooked meals he kept coming back for, and he would tell me it reminded him of all the meals back in Mobile, Alabama. Good at home cooking, he'd say. Little that I knew the day I was born that I was being held by an amazing baseball player. And soon, he'd be my godfather. Most of you knew him as that amazing baseball player that had all those wonderful accomplishments that you, every one of you came up and told him about all the time, which he loved and cherished every moment of watching you smile. And believe me, he was smiling inside as well. I didn't really get to see him play. My highlights were watching him on the Jumbotron. But I loved the Willie who I knew off the field. I was blessed with a friendship I truly never understood until Allison and I were sitting at the Hall of Fame listening to that very speech we just heard. Naturally, all the family was in the front row with my father and mother and all Willie's family, but Allison and I were stuck 12 rows back. Those are many memories that I'll never forget. I remember watching him at the hotel before we left out for his speech, and he was reading three papers just like this. And I said, what's going on, Mac? He said, I'm a little nervous. I know what he meant now. I knew Willie off the field as a man who taught us all values, respect, and mostly how to be humble no matter what achievements you have received. He loved San Francisco more than you'll ever know. And these fans here today, I want to thank you so much on behalf of the family that you're here to share these moments. I remember one time, my brother Rick and I said, hey Willie, why don't you move down next to Rocky in the East Bay? It's great, we found a home. We got some pictures of it. There was that long pause. He turned to me with this look of disgust. He said, Jeffrey, I'm a giant. What would my fans think if I lived over in the A's territory? (laughs) 
Willie came here from a small town in Alabama, Mobile, as you've heard already, and he was faced with adversity and stole all our hearts and united us as giants. Those days sitting at Cooperstown, sitting at the Osiago Hotel, listening to all the players talk and tell their stories, I would just sit there and listen. And there was one common thread that I kept hearing. It didn't matter if it was from Ernie Banks or any of those old timers. They all said, how blessed Willie and the other five, four Hall of Famers were to have Giants as their family. The Giants have been there through every step of Willie's life since he got here in 59. And I want to thank each and every one of you from the ownership, Peter, Larry, Mario, making Willie feel like he had a home here when he wasn't on the field. None of those Hall of Famers ever had that same help, affection, and love by their teams. And to the Giants, I want to thank you very much. <clears throat> Allison and your wonderful grandkids, and your grand, wonderful, his wonderful grandkids, Raven, PJ, and Marissa. He loved you all very much, and he told me many times all the stories. I just wanted you to know that. Estella, thank you for giving us, Willie, these last eight years. Because without you, as all these doctors have told us, he would not have made it through. And we thank you so much for that. I wanted to let you guys know that Willie's walking up there in the clouds right now. I know he is. He can't make up his mind if he wants to gra grab that bat or that one iron or just get out there and putt. But I promise you, he's walking in those clouds. With his mother and father, his siblings, Mrs. Stolval, my grandma and grandpa, along with his great friends, Bobby Bonds, Jimmy Davenport, Ernie Banks, Willie Stargell, Ted Williams, Lon Simmons, and Frank Lemuli. All of them are right next to us, enjoying that celebration of life that we're having for Willie Mack. Thank you. Jeff, thank you so much for sharing. Appreciate it. Next, we are pleased to have with us today the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Please welcome Jeff Idelson. Thank you. On behalf of Hall of Fame Chairman James Forbes Clark, our board of directors, the Hall of Fame members, and our entire staff in Cooperstown, it's an honor to stand before you, although with a very heavy heart. Baseball Hall of Fame embraces the qualities of character, integrity, and sportsmanship. And there's no one who embodies those traits more so than Willie McCovey. Those qualities are a big part of the reason Willie was universally respected and beloved, not only here in San Francisco, but everywhere baseball is played. For those of us who were fortunate to have our lives touched by Willie, we are all the better for it. 
and now we have a responsibility to pass his passion for baseball along to this and future generations. It's what he would have wanted. Five years after his indelible career came to an end, Willie was elected to the Hall of Fame in his first year on the ballot. In fact, he was the only player sent to Cooperstown by the baseball writers in 1986. His election class, his election class also included Bobby Doerr and Ernie Lombardi. When it was Willie's turn to speak in July, he used his time to talk about the intersection of family and baseball, a common theme here today. He stood on the induction stage in the rain and said, one reason it seems so right today is because it's the summertime and it's Sunday. Sundays and summertime only mean two things to me. It's a time for baseball and it's a time for families. Both have been very important to me throughout my life. Each one has enriched the other. Baseball and family together have brought me here today before you. Willie used the rest of his speech recounting how each of his families were incredibly important to him, his own family, the family he developed living in his community here in San Francisco, the Giants family, and the family of fans in this city who lovingly embraced him. There are many ways to measure the greatness of a person, but it's the words and actions of others who know him or her the best that really say the most. Many people don't realize that Mobile, Alabama, where Willie was raised, is home to five baseball Hall of Famers. Together, Satchel Paige, Ozzie Smith, Billy Williams, Henry Aaron, and Willie, all legends of the game, comprise yet another McCovey family. When Willie was called up and arrived at Seal Stadium in 1959, he requested number 44 because of his great respect and admiration for Hank Aaron who had joined the Milwaukee Braves five years earlier. When I spoke to Henry on Tuesday, he said, I was extremely proud that Willie wanted to wear number 44 just like I did. That meant the world to me. I thought the world of Willie. We were both from Mobile, we both made the majors, and we both ended up in the Hall of Fame. How about that? He went on to add, Willie was a very special person, and you had to know him to appreciate him because he was so quiet and lived his life with so little fanfare. I will miss him greatly. Ozzie Smith was born in Mobile and lived there until the first grade. I got my first major league hit in 1978 against the Giants and Willie was at first base, Ozzie told me. He gave me the ball and he wished me good luck. It was an incredible moment for me. Ozzie went on to say, everyone wonders how five Hall of Famers could come from Mobile. They think that maybe there was something in the water. I think it was more about the work ethic you learned growing up from great examples like Willie. It was the work ethic that took Willie who was blessed with talent and allowed him to improve, allowed him to become great. I admired Willie as a player and a person, and Ozzy went on to add that his mom's favorite player growing up in Mobile was Willie McCovey. And then there was sweet swinging Billy Williams, who grew up six miles outside of Mobile in Whistler, Alabama, and joined the Cubs the same year Willie put on a Giants uniform. He didn't meet Willie until he was in the minors. As Billy told me, he and my brother Frank were both in the Western League and they became fast friends. We all became close and we would work out at Harbor Field in Mobile with Hank during those first few winters after the season ended. Billy went on to say, Willie was a giant of a man and mild-mannered. <coughs> he did his best to inspire the kids from Mobile. I'll fondly remember Willie as a fellow Mobilian, a great first baseman, and for the memorable times we had every summer in Cooperstown, after we made the Hall of Fame. I wish I could be there for his homecoming today. May his family accept my thoughts and prayers as comfort. The fifth Hall of Famer for Mobile was the great Satchel Paige who passed away in 1982. And I am sure the always colorful and spry right-hander is up in heaven right now, standing on the mound, looking in at Willie Mack, deciding whether to throw him, smoke at his yoke or pee at his knee. Either way, we all know it doesn't matter. Willie can handle high heat or pitch down in the zone. Rest in peace, Willie. Cooperstown, Mobile, and the entire baseball community mourns the loss of one of its most beloved family members. Thank you. Swung on, hit deep to right. Going back as Clemente. He is looking, and you can tell it goodbye, a grand slam. Willie McCovey's 13th Grand Slam of his career. Nice to have you back, Stretch.
He turns, he locks, it's gone! A home run for Willie McCovey. Listen to the ovation for McCovey. It is going, it is going, gone! A home run for Willie McCovey. Way back, way back, it is gone! A home run for Willie McCovey. Drive to deep left field. Back goes Crawford, still going back. It's gone! A grand slam home run! McCovey with the 14th grand slam of his major league career. And now we get to hear from some of Mr. McCovey's good friends and former teammates, Felipe Alou, Joe Amalfitano, and the Hall of Famer, Gaylord Perry. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's one of my favorite spots, uh, San Francisco. When I got out of high school in North Carolina, that was my dream to, to get up here in the big leagues. And we did it. Got sent back down a couple of times. But uh, I'm going to let you people know, when I was in Tacoma, Washington, we waited to get our uniforms that like the day before we pitched, I uh, started the league play. And what we got was last year's leftovers from San Francisco. I would always get McCuffins because he was the only big guy that uh, on the team. So I kind of hid out in the clubhouse so I could get my special uniform on Willie McCovey. I did that for two years. Didn't hit very much though. Sure could pitch. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, when I got here and, and finally made a club in 62 and got sent down a couple times, but on those two years up here, I learned a great deal to use McCovey's bat only swing at pitches that he would swing at. But uh, we finally got together and, uh, you know, he had a, a special pickoff play with me, with men on first base. He would say, hey, dummy, you know, they're getting too big a lead. Or he had a sign that he would touch his left knee or something. It was very special. He, he wanted to quietly get ahead. And I was uh, with the Giants when they started the lawyers in the clubhouse. And McCovey was the number one lawyer. And if you uh, did the things wrong at the right time, he would see you and you would dearly to pay for it. But uh, he was a guy that was, was honest. So uh, we got along fine after I stopped throwing that football. That was fun days, man. That's see, you know, it was very special. He kept calling for it all the time too. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to make sure that he uh, got Alvin Dark, who was a manager at the time, that he could play first base with that ball going to him a lot. And uh, we had a great time. I know that uh, we got we got in the playoffs, and uh, McCovey was our leader. Uh, he had a lot of help in, in Mays and uh, some of the other guys that we had up, Davenport, Tom Howler. It's, they were very special people. And San Francisco fans were very special. I got a ovation for the first time one day, and I didn't know what to do. 
But anyway, uh, I appreciate uh, the Giants having me here. Uh, they they were my life while I was playing ball. Uh, I love them dearly, and still do. Thank you very much, folks. Good afternoon. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to thank the Giants, to Larry, for having me come back to California. I was here for opening day, and uh, I don't know where. I was almost paralyzed. No feeling in my arms or my legs, but I, I managed to walk from that dugout to behind home plate, and um, they placed me right next to Willie McCovey's wheelchair. And I grabbed to make sure I didn't fall down. I was going to ask Willie, how do you feel? And instead, McCovey said, Felipe, how do you feel? So he was that kind of man. I spent quite some time with him in spring training on field two. And I went all the way back to where we were teammates in Triple A Ball Phoenix, Arizona, before we came out to the big leagues. And uh, we were also teammates in winter ball, and obvious, obviously teammates right here with the Giants. Now, we all know all of the grand slams or all of the home runs, but. Uh, I, I got to know Willie Mack, that man. Um, I invited him to go to play winter ball in the Dominican Republic. And he asked the giant to let him go. And the giant let him go. And uh, by that time, I was living with my parents. And uh, Willie Mack was put in an apartment by himself. And one day he told me that he wanted to come back home to the U.S. because he was homesick and he hated to let me down and let the Winter League team down, but he missing his family and all. So I told him, listen, I'm going to move in with you. And I did, and he stayed there the rest of the year. He hit a bunch of home runs and helped the club win. And uh, he, of course, he came up to the big leagues and then he never went back to winter ball. But anyway, going back to my first year in pro ball, it was Orlando Cepeda's second year in pro ball. And Orlando told me there is a skinny guy here who also plays first base who can hit the ball nine miles. And his name is Willie McCovey. But anyway, I, I saw Willie uh, a little younger than me in batting practice hit the ball over the pine trees. Yeah, but I didn't get to really know the man and know the caliber of player until we wound up on the same team in AAA ball. We were living in an apartment with an older player. And one day, Willie, who was the youngest of the three, he said, Felipe, you and I don't belong. We don't belong here. I'm going to start looking for a place in Phoenix. And he found us a place. And with a nice family that used to cook uh, black, black bean and rice and stuff with us. And we were having a good time, and we left on a road trip. And Willie had bought us an $80 used car, $80 used car. So we could commute between the apartment and, and the ballpark. And we knew every filling station where they had water because the radiator or the, or the car was, was leaking. It was leaking when we were putting the water at the filling station, but that's what... We, went, we, we took a fly of an, an airline named, uh, whatever, KLM, and we uh, flew from Phoenix to L.A., and there was a four-hour layover in L.A., and Willie said, listen, I have a sister in LA, and she's a great cook. So the two of us, we're gonna take a cab and we're gonna go and eat with her. And we made that mistake, and on the way back, we didn't know all of the traffic in LA, we missed our flight. <laughs> then, by the time we arrived in Seattle, 
the game was already over. So the fine, the fine was that we had to pay for the plane ticket. But anyway, now they called me up to the big league from Seattle, and I didn't have to pay the, the flight, but Willie had to pay the flight. And then he went back to Phoenix, and he sold the car for the same $80. Uh, he, he sent me my 40. So I called Willie, I said, listen, I don't need the 40, I'm in the big league. And he said, no, yeah, that is your money. That, that was the kind of man he was. But anyway, he, uh, I'm saying that I'm glad to be here because the, when Bertha called me and said, Felipe, you know, Willie is gonna pass, you know, can you come by? And I really didn't have much permission because I, I just need replacement. And I said, you know what, I'm going to make an effort. And the effort was made uh, to, uh, to the Giants. And I'm glad to be back here. But there was a time that I don't believe that I would ever see California again. <laughs> Finally. Finally. We came here in 1958, a, a bunch of kids. And Willie obviously came, came up in 59. Another, another child, another kid. I, I have been a very well privileged person, you know, that I, I got to play with five Hall of Fame players with the Giants. All of them Giants grown up players. To me, it's what, what the highlight of my life, but another highlight is to be able to be roommate with Willie McCovey in three different leagues. I just hope that this building and this surroundings will continue to, in the city of San Francisco, the fans, to develop men and players, but especially men the caliber of Willie Mack. I believe it was an example. It was an example for me even though he was younger. So thank you very much, and God bless everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felipe. <clears throat> well, uh, everybody talk about Willie. Uh, about <clears throat> my, in 1958, I met Willie. I came from Puerto Rico for a tryout for the Giants, and Willie did the same. We are the same age. We check in the same day in Malibu, Florida for a tryout. So in 59, uh, Bill Rigney asked me, if I move to left field, uh, let this skinny kid from AAA to play first base. I said, no problem. So we compete. Uh, me and Willie, who's gonna play first base? Uh, I never complained. We didn't never complain because William McCovey, he was my roommate. When I, when, I, when I came to San Francisco, he looked for an apartment for me. We were very close. I mean, we lived next to each other. We used to go out together to listen to jazz in San Francisco, North Beach. <clears throat> so I knew Woody very well, very well. Woody McCovey was one of the neatest human beings I've ever seen in my life. He was so clean. That was incredible. Incredible. He, you go to his house, the same distance of the ashtray 
right? Well, the nearest person I've ever met in my life. He was so clean. He, the shoes, side the shoes, uh, amazing. So I say that I know Woody pretty good. We live next to each other in the avenues. And he used to bring me to the ballpark every single day. And because we compete, they think that we are enemy. No, we are very close, great friend, until the, he left. So, really hurt me about Willie, but uh, that's the way it is. But I have to say that I'm very proud that I knew Woody very well. Like I say before, we came the same day to Melbourne, Florida in 1958. We are the same age and we share some great time together. And uh, I'm sad because I lost a great friend because uh, what he did on the field, everybody knows what he did. But as a human being, Woody McCovey was very special. He was very quiet. He don't say much, but he had a big heart, you know. He was a great ball player. I remember in 1960, in 1959, he was the rookie of the year. 1960, one day, I came to the clubhouse. I saw Willie sitting in his locker with no shirt. I said, what's going on, Willie? He said, they sent me down to Tacoma, AAA. He don't complain. He don't say nothing. He was a man. That's why uh, we took it very hard what happened to him. But he was my friend. I'm very proud that he was my friend. I played with him. We roomed together. You know, I roomed with Willie for a couple of years. And Willie didn't say one word to me. I say oh, that, uh, Willie, are you mad at me? He say, no, Chico, he used to call me Chico. Why? Well, you haven't talked to me in a couple of weeks. I say, come on, Chico, that's the way I am. You know? <laughs> so I learned that. But he's a guy with a big heart. He don't say too much. He was say too much, but he was a great man, a great teammate, and I miss him very much. Thank you. Come on, Johnny. You want to talk? Usually, Willie Mack hit fourth. I got to hit fourth today. <clears throat> Our friendship started in 1957 in Dallas AA, Texas League. Willie was by far the best player on our team and in the league. And then our careers the next year took us to Phoenix, the Coast League. First year the Phoenix was in the Coast League, and Willie and I were teammates again. Both those experiences, especially in Dallas with Salty Parker, who was our manager, if we learned anything there, I believe we learned how to win, 
and we also learn to respect the game. Willie, by far, was the best player that I ever played with in the minor leagues, and it went on in his career where he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Earlier was shown about the grand slams that he hit. I got to see a few of them as a teammate and a little bit there when I was a coaching staff with the Giants. But I'd like to share one with you that was kind of memorable to me. We were in Candlestick, and it was the bottom of the ninth, and we're playing the Houston Astros, and a guy named DeRocher was their manager who uh, managed that guy over there, Mays, and I got to sit and watch him manage it because I didn't play, and rightfully so, I didn't know how to play. But getting back to this incident, it was the bottom of the ninth, and we were down by three runs. Bases were loaded. Well, Willie hit one of those grand slams they're talking about. We came out of the dugout, not that the hype that the players do today, uh, and with that, we congratulated him. And then I started to go into the dugout, which was on first base, to go into the clubhouse. But DeRocher, again, who I had played for, and ended up coaching for him, he stopped me, and I had to walk with him to the door in right field to go to the visitor's clubhouse. And I'll share this with you. He said to me, that man will never do that again to me. Uh, what do you mean? He'll never do that again against me. What do you intend to do? I'm going to walk him. And I think that that happened very with uh, the manager of the Diamondbacks, uh, Showalter. Did he walk you? Yeah. Well, he must have took the cue from DeRocher. But, you know, DeRocher... Uh, uh, was a, uh, uh, an icon in his time, I believe he was. But get back to Willie. I sat with him uh, one day up in his box here in this ballpark, and was uh, we were playing Baltimore, and it was interleague play. And uh, we got into a jam there. We, were, we had a nice lead, and we were giving it up. But here was the scene, and this is the tell you how astute and what he was really into the game you know because really like it's been said here a very quiet guy very quiet it wasn't too quiet though when that bat got in the hitting zone it was moving well we're there and uh, now uh, we uh, they Baltimore's got two runners on we're up by about two runs late in the game and now uh, our pitcher, and I don't recall who, but Boach had the club, uh, he unintentionally walked this guy. <laughs> so the next hitter was a guy named Machado. But needless to say, he hit one. But before he hit it, Willie Mack said to me, Joe, I think we just made a mistake. <laughs> and we definitely did. The day that they uh, unveiled Gaylord Perry's statue over here. I was chatting with Willie, and it was a morning affair. And I asked him, uh, I said, you know, uh, are you going to stay for the game tonight? He said, I think I will, but I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to go home. And then he proceeded to tell me what it took for him to get ready to face the day. And it was something. You know, uh, this guy, his presence will be missed in this ballpark. I know it will because, you know, I watch a lot of games on television, and a lot of times they'll sh take a shot at him in his box up there. He's always there. His presence will be missed there. And also when I, he parks his car, I guess, back there, whoever the driver is, and, goes, and all those people used to see him go to the elevator, they're going to miss him. But they will never be forgotten. It's called McCovey Cove.
This city embraced him. He had a love affair with this city. I just think it's great that when somebody comes to this ballpark, let's go to McCovey's Cove. Well, they should, if they haven't gotten yet, they should go there. And then look at the numbers that are posted under that statue and what he did. And with those numbers, because we're in a business now that's all about numbers, I know that. I'm an old conservative guy. The numbers and the conservative guys go together. But those numbers, again, are his. When you look at him, there's a pulse and a heartbeat there with those numbers. That guy played for the name in the front of his uniform, not the one in the back. October 31, Mac, his earthly life ended. His eternal life began. This guy, again, will never be forgotten. I'm so grateful and thankful that I'm here today, but most of all, that I got to be a teammate and a friend of his. Thank you. I would like you all to keep the applause going for those legendary forever giants. Gaylord Perry, Orlando Cepeda, Felipe Alou, and Joe Amalfitano. Oh, look, you guys are getting a standing ovation. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. And now we do have one more individual who would like to share some remarks. Of course, he was very, of course, he was very close to Mr. McCovey. He's also a legendary giant, Barry Bonds. Thank you very much. I know Mike Kruko's over there going, I cannot believe Barry's speaking. <laughs> this isn't often. But I have a great connection with McCovey and this community growing up here my entire life and my family and all of us kids, us and Fuentes, we all grew up together. And we all feel very privileged to have each and every one of these individuals in our lives, and yet all of us are still together as kids and now adults ourselves. Um, I go back with Mac as a little boy as much as I went back as Willie Mays. I idolized Willie Mays, but I was born left-handed, and my first glove was a first baseman glove. So as much as I always wanted to be like, say hey, I always had to stretch like Mac. Um, my father and, and, and McCovey were great friends, and Mac loved our family unconditionally. And in 1993, when I came back to San Francisco, I, I, I asked Mac if I could call him Uncle Mac, because I've always admired him, and he's always taught me the game of baseball as much as Willie and my father has. And Mac said, if, I wouldn't want anything more than you to call me Uncle Mac. I also want to thank the Giants organization for allowing Mac to be here, which is tough for me to say, to have my number retired and my uncle here. And I appreciate that a lot. Uh, 
I want to thank you, Mac, because we're connected. I want to thank the Giants for giving Mac that cove out there. And I want to thank Mac for allowing me to hit a bunch of baseballs in his cove. <laughs> Like I said, I'm, I'm connected. I'm connected in left field. My godfather's in center field. My father's in right field. Mac played first base. Gaylord on the mound. Tito, second base. Chris Fire, shortstop. I wish Jimmy Ray Hart was still around. He'd be my third baseman. Dave Rader was catching at that time when I was a little boy. And McCovey, thank you so much for allowing me to out hit everyone in your cove. Thank you. You did great, baby. You did great. You did. Love you. Thank you, Barry. Willie's wife, Miss Estella, wanted me to convey her deep appreciation and share with you this message that she wrote. In the past week since our Willie passed away, I have received so much love, support, and comforting words. There are so many great stories that have been told and shared. They have helped me cope during these difficult and painful times. I would like to thank everyone, especially the healthcare professionals who cared for Willie for so many years. Willie got the best care we could ask for. Thank you to the whole San Francisco Giants family and the Hall of Fame family for all of your kindness, love, and deep friendships throughout the years. I want to thank all of the fans for coming out on this day of remembrance and celebration of Willie's life. Most of all, to Rocky Dudum, Shirley Figgins, and Harold Silen for being there throughout the years. They embraced him and considered him as their own family. Thank you all, Mrs. Estella McCovey. Who Willie Mack was and what he embodied, he's got that charisma, that delightful presence, that smile. Though so he was just a legendary competitor and leader. To be honored with his name is one of the greatest feelings. That award is, is based upon uh, what type of character and teammate you are, and uh, also contributing on the field. So just to have my name mentioned alongside Willie McCovey and the previous winners is a, means a great deal to me. Thank you. voted on by the guys in the clubhouse that you're battling with every day and they see the, all the work that you put in. I think it's the biggest honor that you can have as a Giants player. That's a huge accomplishment and we all want to be good teammates. That's what we strive to do and perform on the field too. That's one of my, my favorite awards just, just because of the fact of who it comes from. When I found out I won it, it was really special. But then going out on the field, seeing my girls, my wife, my parents, it's one of those things that I'll never forget. One of the cooler moments I've had in my career. It's pretty overwhelming to be standing here with uh, Giants legends and being mentioned in the same uh, company uh, with Willie McCovey. It's incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, our beloved broadcaster and a two-time Willie Mack Award winner, Mike Kruko. Thank you, Rennell. Before I get started, uh, I, I do want to say it is an honor here to be able to, to share my memories of uh, an idol and a friend. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to invite up all of the past Willie Mack Award winners. Please come to the stage and join me. join me. 
1980, when they announced the first Willie Mack Award winner, I was playing with the Cubs, and Jack Clark was the recipient of that award. And from afar, I thought, that's the coolest thing I ever heard of. Willie McCovey was special in so many ways. I spoke with Chili Davis last week, and we were just telling stories about Big Mac. He said, you know, when I put on the first uniform for the Minnesota Twins, I asked to be number 44. I said, why? He says, well, I wanted to honor him. And then he thought for a second, and, and he said, but I wanted to be like him. And that's something that a lot of people said. I know I said it in Los Angeles when I was a kid. My idol on the Dodgers was Don Drysdale, and Willie McCovey used to wear him out. And I kind of had a half ass attitude about Willie. I mean, I didn't like him. But I wanted to be like him. I started hitting wiffle balls in the backyard left-handed because I wanted to be like McCovey. And if I hit one, I would take the home run trot, and my elbows would be high, my hands would be up around my chest where he would have them. And I thought the coolest thing was how he would get in the on-deck circle and he would take a knee. And nobody did that. McCovey did, and I did too. Can you imagine inspiring a kid in Southern California? Imagine what he did here. And that was what was special about the man. When I got to professional baseball, Willie was still playing. And uh, as good fortune would have it, I had an opportunity to play against him. One night, Candlestick Park, uh, runners at first and second, I think it was Daryl Evans, or maybe Jack Clark. But they were in the batter's box, two outs, two on, and I looked over in the on-deck circle, and there's McCovey, he's kneeling down. And I'm thinking, oh my lord. Well, I walk Clark. And here comes McCovey, the guy who's got 18 lifetime grand slams more than any other big league hitter that ever played the game. He's stepping in the batter's box. And we had a battle. And I threw a curveball down right around the inside corner around the knees, and he hit a monster shot down the line in right field. And I turned and looked at it, and I knew it was fair. But in looking down the right field line, I could see the first base umpire. He was jogging out, and he stumbled. And he didn't see that the ball wrapped around the foul pole. When it landed, it was in the upper deck and it was foul, but when it went out, it was fair by 10 feet. And he goes, foul ball. And I had a reprieve. And I had a Willie McCovey story. Now, he struck out on the next pitch. But he looked at me as he left the batter's box and he smiled because he knew he had me. I was number 19. We got traded to the Giants in 1982. The first guy to meet me there as we were having a press conference was Willie McCovey. And the first thing he said to me was, you know, you're number 19. <laughs> and he called me 19 for the rest of our relationship. When I was with the Giants in 83, Mike Murphy gave me a locker next to Willie McCovey. McCovey had Juni there, he had bats, and he wasn't even playing, he was retired. But every day he'd get to the ballpark and he'd put on his stirrups and his socks and his uniform pants and his sleeves, and he'd sit in front of his locker, and uh, he would have this great big ham bone, or I don't even, I didn't even know what it was, I'd never seen it, could have been a rhinoceros bone. And it was bolted to a piece of wood, and he would sit there and he would bone bats. Bats that were never going to be in a big league game. His career was over. But you talk about the presence of a veteran in a clubhouse, especially with all the young ball players that we had back in the day. Chili Davis, Bob Brindley, Tom O'Malley, Danny Gladden. And guess what? They all used that bone. They all wore their socks like Willie. And I think that's what he gave all of us. In some small way, we wanted to be like him. As he walked through life, we'd see him at the ballpark, and I think this is where he was most magical. This is where his power was. And we'd see him and Estella every day. They'd come to the ballpark, and Kipe and I would be in the booth next to theirs, 
And we would see the endless parade of Giants fans that came up. And they just wanted to give testimony. They wanted to tell him what he meant to them. How much they loved him. Some of them never saw him play. He lived in the stories that were told to them by their grandparents, by their parents, by their aunts and uncles, by their neighbors. It was all about the love that was given back to McCovey for all the love that he gave us. And when he walked out of this ballpark at night, or I should say when he was pushed in a cart, or when he was pushed in a bed, and you knew it was painful, he never, ever complained. Not once. You could ask him how he's doing, it would always be the same answer. Oh, I'm fine. Got a ball game, it'll all be good. But when he left the stadium, there was an endless parade of people that were giving him high fives and knuckles. They just wanted to touch him. They just wanted to tell him how much they loved him. And as I watched him be wheeled away with that attitude, I would hold my cane. And I would say, I want to be like him. Now the fact of the matter is, we've been lucky to be able to have the microphone and tell our stories about Willie McCovey. When in, we could ask every one of you to come up here and grab the microphone and you would have a story about how he touched you, about how you wanted to be like him. And they'd be great stories. And perhaps that was his gift to all of us. He gave us that feeling that we knew him that he was sitting there at the dinner table, that he was part of us. You know that line with the Beatles, eh? in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make? He walked out of here with a lot of love. Every one of us gave him a piece of ourselves. And the beauty of the man is that he knew it. We loved him. Thank you, Willie. Rest in peace, gentle giant. Thank you so much, Mike, for that. We have one last order of business before we close. But right now, on behalf of the Giants family, Ms. Estella and Mr. McCovey's family, we thank you all so, so much for being here to share in this beautiful celebration of life for our beloved Stretch McCovey. And now, as we close, Let's listen to one of Willie's last at bats, and it's a good one, and it's dramatic, at Candlestick Park. Take a listen. Here comes McCovey. Willie Mack is coming up. Listen to the ovation for McCovey. Willie McCovey will bat for Nepper. Willie Mack getting a standing ovation here. He's out there on deck and now starts the trek up to the plate. Listen to the roar for Willie McCovey. Now he's being announced. Another roar in response to the announcement. Up here with two men out of runner at first score tie. Swung on and hit in the up the alley and right center field. A base hit going all the way to the wall. Then he's sitting around third. He's coming home. There is the relay to Lopes. No throw. And the ball game is over. McCovey with a double. 
and a run batted in, and the Giants have won it. The congratulations are all for McCovey. The Giants are mobbing Willie Mack, who delivered a double to drive in the winning run. Willie McCovey with the Giants all around him, coming across the first baseline, heading back toward the dugout, and this crowd is on its feet as one. And a salute to Willie McCovey. This crowd is still on its feet. They'll want an acknowledgement from Willie McCovey, I am sure. The Dodgers are headed reluctantly down toward the runway in the right field corner. Fans still on their feet, applauding Willie McCovey, who appeared as a pinch hitter in these, the closing days of his career, and delivered a ringing double to right center field that scored. Rennie Stennett with a winning run from first base. And the chant of We Want Willie. The crowd and the chant of We Want Willie. Apparently McCovey has gone all the way back to the locker room to get a brief respite between games of the doubleheader. The crowd still on its feet, peering down toward the dugout. And they've started to chant again of We Want Willie. But there's no sign of Willie so far. The chant still of we want Willie. We want Willie. So we're going to hold on here just a moment. In the event that he does. In the event that he does decide to acknowledge the chant of we want Willie. I'm sure that in order to do that, he'd have to come from the locker room all the way down from that right field corner where it's located to the dugout. Photographers are poised down there in the event that he comes out. They don't want to miss that. And the bad boy has just come out with a message for one of the photographers. So again, we're going to hang on here for a moment so that if he does come out and acknowledge the plaudits of the crowd, you'll be able to hear their acknowledgement of his acknowledgement. Members of the crowd still chanting, we want Willie. He was mobbed by the Giants after he had pulled up at second base. And here comes Willie McCovey holding his cap in his hand. McCovey in front of the dugout. Listen to the roar. McCovey waves his cap around and then marches back into the dugout. And so, once again, he has received the affectionate plaudits of the crowd here at Candlestick Park.